On the phone right now, we have my one of my favorite guests, the great uh, film critic. A lot to talk to him about his, uh, his former partner, the great Roger Ebert, passing some great movies out, including 42. Tribeca Film Festival is getting bigger and bigger every year. Uh, and anything else, really. The great Richard Roper. What's up, Rich? Hey, Artie. How you doing, man? You know, that's so true about weightlifting and basketball. I was not a good basketball player. I was more like Artie, more of a baseball player. But I remember, like, when we were kids, you'd weightlift, and then you'd try to shoot the basketball, and it would go, like, over the backboard. Yeah, yeah you, you can. Know, totally. Yard, you know, that's right. Totally. Up. Yeah, you, gotta, you, gotta, you, gotta, you can't be too pumped. And baseball, too, if you... You know, if you get too pumped, Jose Canseco found that out. To, to hit, you can't really hit that well. Uh, Jose Canseco also found out you become an enormous jerk-off. <laughs> I will say this, though, in defense of Ray Allen, uh, he was, you know, one of the best jobs of a athlete in a movie he, when he played Jesus Shuttlesworth. He got game. He got game, right? That is a great... He got, ga he got game as a movie not talked about enough. You got the great Denzel Washington, and, and Spike yeah. Lee is a talented guy and uh, can tell a story. And, you know, uh, uh, Ray Allen is amazing in that. Like, uh, the emotional stuff when he's got to... You know, when he deals with the father and, and, and his kid brother and sister and... Or kid sister and stuff. Uh, yeah, he pulled that off big time. Yeah, especially had, bang, banging actually, the two banging the two white chicks down at the college visit was very. Yeah, nice. and then I, I think he also had a love scene with a young Rosario Dawson. That's right. Go wrong there, right? <laughs> That's right. That's right. And, it, was, uh, it was either Rosario or Andre Dawson. I forget who. <laughs> <laughs> you know, in the right light. <laughs> they both have amazing pecs. Do you know? For, I do, a, you know, uh, I, when I was at, when I was at Mad TV, Richard, this is not a lie. I've said this before. I pitched as a sketch Andre Dawson's Creek. <laughs> <laughs> Idea ever. It got uh, got turned down. But what were you saying? <laughs> oh, I, actually, this is very cool. About five, six years ago, uh, for some ABC special about sports and movies, I got to go to Ray Allen's house. He had just moved to Boston when he had been traded to the Celtics. Right. He went down to his screening room and right. watched He Got Game together. He hadn't watched <laughs> it in a long time. That was pretty cool. Uh, it's gone. I hope the two actors that played those two girls he bangs were there serving chips. I would have been his uh, lovely wife was serving. Uh, yeah. was was the craft services uh, person. Uh, he's really he's actually a very cool guy and maybe maybe the best shooter in NBA that's, history. That's right what up. I that's what I've heard. And he's up there with another former Celtic. I'm sure Larry Bird. It's a good conversation. Yeah. But yeah, I mean again, the Heat picking him up. My God, I mean if if he if his three point shots on in the first quarter, why continue the game? <laughs> why yeah. why well, continue? You know, I, I do love the fact that you know even to this day, there's a lot of people who just hate LeBron James. Yeah. I mean, they just, hate him I'm one because of, of that whole ESPN special. And it's kind of interesting because either the same people walking around with Michael Vick jerseys yeah. and Lexico Bur Burris, you know, home gun kits. There's no <laughs> problem with that. But they hate LeBron James because he was arrogant. Yeah, he, he, well, he took arrogance to a new level, but uh, I would rather my sports hero shoot himself in the leg in a club any day of the week. Uh, got on the sweatpants. What could possibly go wrong? <laughs> so, uh, on a serious note, we got to talk about this. There's no one better in the public yeah. eye to talk about this. With uh, uh, your partner, Roger Ebert, passing away. I met Roger a couple of times at the Howard Stern show. Mm -hmm. Could not have been a more delightful, nice guy. And when you talk to him for... He was one of those guys, when you talk to him for just 15 seconds, you yeah. knew he was an insanely intelligent man and interesting yeah. and could talk about anything. So talk a little bit about, <laughs> about Roger Ebert uh, uh, and, and your relationship with him. Yeah, I mean, he, he was the guy you saw on TV, or, you know, and he and Gene were great guests with yeah. Stern way back in the day. Great they, guests. They gave they... back to Howard yep. in a way that few guests could. They were awesome. But, yeah, you know, Roger, I met Roger when I first started at the Chicago Sun-Times because he was the film critic there for 40 years, so right. I mean, I've known him for 25 years, and then, of course, I had the chance to do the, the TV show with them, and it was a blast. I mean, it was like being in a movie fantasy camp every <laughs> week. I got to see movies with Roger Ebert and then discuss them with him on TV and get paid for it. Yeah. You know, it, he was just, and he was a great storyteller because Roger was from that last generation, too, that really had access to movie stars because now, of course, it's all controlled by the publicist. You get 10 minutes while they're in the room, right. you know, those kind of junket things. But he, you know, if you go back, one of his early books, it's like he spent like a week with Robert Mitchum. Wow. You know, he would get that kind of access. He, yeah. You know, we went to a screening once on, on some lot in Hollywood. We're in the screening room, and he goes, I saw, I saw Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid here with Newman and Redford in 69. <laughs> but he wouldn't say it like name dropping. It was just his life. Yeah, he was just know? telling the story. Now, again, that brings up the problem a critic could have if you get famous and start rubbing elbows. It's a conflict of interest. How can, yeah. you, then, how can you then honestly review a Robert Mitchell movie after that? You know, I mean, do you think that was a problem for him? 
You know, not for Roger. I mean, he was he was really good friends with Robert Altman, the late great director, yeah. and the other people like that. And I think that was tough for him. Although, you know, Altman famously told him at one point, "Look, if you didn't give me any crappy reviews, why would I like the good ones?" You know? <laughs> it's true. You're, you're right. I, would have, I wouldn't respect you. So, uh, you know, and that was the reason that Gene and Roger, and then Roger and myself, we always kept the show in Chicago mm -hmm. because we knew if that show, you know, it would have been a lot cheaper for Disney, which owned the show, to do it in L.A. You know, sure. but it was you know we had to have a studio here in Chicago and hire a crew and everything every week. But we were separated from that, so you know day in and day out, Gene and Roger weren't rubbing elbows with the Hollywood people. They were running into people at you know O'Rourke's Pub or at the Billy Goat or whatever. Yeah, he was a oh, you know obviously what you guys do. Part of what you guys do involves writing, and and mm -hmm. and you've written books and the uh, one I talk about quite a bit, Socks in the City, that I enjoyed a lot about the White Sox after they won mm -hmm. in 05. But writing is a big part of what you do, and and a lot of different different forms. Roger was a great writer. He wrote screenplays, he wrote books, and he wrote his reviews. Yeah, even even <clears throat> excuse me, even even Cisco would say the one thing that Roger could beat him on. He was just such a natural writer. And uh -huh. he, you know, just a, he was always a beautiful, graceful writer. And you know, as the years went on and then Roger got sick and he literally lost his voice, that's all he had was his tweets and his blog and his website. And he started writing about a lot more than movies. And I think he found, like, another gear, you know, he, like, uh, as a writer. I mean, his stuff, I think people will remember a lot of that stuff as much as his movie reviews. Great stuff that he would just, you know, go off on, whatever, whether it was politics right. or religion. You know, he talked about death. He wrote about death. He knew that he wasn't going to be around for many, many more years. And it was just, you know, brilliant stuff. Yeah, he was, uh, he seemed to be a humble guy, a brilliant guy, and uh, and a multi-talented guy. And I think if you're truly a creative person, uh, you could lose a lot and still entertain yourself and be happy, uh, especially writing. Like, you just went to a different form of it. Anyway, he'll he'll be he'll be missed, and uh, sorry to hear about that. I know you were, you know, obviously better friends with him than most people, but uh, R.I.P. Roger Ebert. Um, appreciate you talking about it a little sure, bit. Sure, of course. Back to the, 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 the present world here we're living in. 42. I haven't got the chance to see it. Uh, what are your thoughts on 42? You know, I liked it. It's amazing that there's never really been, like, a major motion picture about Jackie Robinson. That was my first about, thought. You know? That was my Isn't first thought, yeah, when I saw it. I was this, I, But when you think about it, no, it hasn't been done, yeah. And I think a lot of younger people, they know the 42 number because, you know, of it not being, you know, worn by anybody other than Mariano Rivera. Right. And all of that stuff. But he's just a name to them, like Martin Luther King, Rosa Parks, Jackie Robinson. Yeah. So, you know, it's the guy, this kid named Chadwick Boseman, who plays Jackie Robinson. And Artie, Artie I know you're with me on this. It's great to see when an actor looks like an athlete, because there's nothing worse. Definitely. Than, like, you know, uh, Definitely. you know, when Rob Lowe played a hockey player in Youngblood and his ankles <laughs> turned in, you know. Right. And rouge on his cheeks. So exactly. Rouge, you know. Exactly. That would be like me. Why don't I just play Rob Lowe in a movie, if that's the case? Yeah, <laughs> so, I mean, and he's, a, you know, he's a, he looks like an athlete. He moves like an athlete. He's a good actor. Uh, my problem with it is it's almost too reverential, too worshipful. It, it makes him, it makes Jackie Robinson such a saint. That's the trap you fall into with that. You right. know, it's hard to to be critical of him when you know he's you know, a he's a human being. And well, here's the thing too. And Jackie Robinson, there's there's one great scene early on when when Harrison Ford plays Branch Rickey, and they're talking about he's hell bent. He's going to bring somebody up. You know, he's, he's like you know, and Harrison Ford, by the way, when he overacts, it's the worst thing ever. I was going to say, what's you know, he like in it? I, that was an odd choice. I thought I'm going to bring a Negro ball player into the major <laughs> leagues, and I'll tell you why. And then the music cues, you know, and everything. You're like, oh, my God, you know, Han Solo, relax. But, <laughs> but there's a great scene where they talk about it, and, you know, the, the candidates were Roy Campanella, Don Newcomb, some guys who came up the next year or two. Right. And Branch Rickey says, those guys are too nice. I need someone who's tougher than that because he's going to take so much abuse. Yeah. And Jackie yeah. Robinson was a little bit of a hard-nosed guy. He got kicked out of the Army because he wouldn't move to the back of a bus. So right. Like Rosa Parks. They don't really show that much of his character. You know, there's a lot of him just sort of, you know, stoically taking it, like, you know, St. Jackie. It's well done, but I would have liked to see a more complex portrayal of the guy. But they, And again, they would have done themselves justice in doing that, and ironically enough, they would have uh, they would have given him a bigger compliment as a person if they would have showed that, because it's why I admire him so much. When you really break it down and look at what he had to do, he needed to be a guy who was tough as nails. He needed to be yeah. a guy who wouldn't take that crap, but at the same time, on a certain level, take it just enough to where he didn't start start huge confrontations every single game and ruin the experiment, if you want to call it that, early on, because that's what he would have done. So you need a guy tough enough to take it, but also tough enough not to take it for a little while, you know? 
Yeah, I mean, you know, there, there, there are some good moments. I mean, you know, the, the, the Phillies had this manager, this, this real-life guy yeah. who was like this hateful guy who, as a player with the Yankees, used to do the Nazi salute to Hank Greenberg. Oh, I mean, this, man. This, this, you, know, I mean, you, you, you can't invent the character. Yeah, and that's there's brutal. scene where he's, you know, taunting Jackie, and Branch Rickey does make the point. If you go after him, it's not going to be about him. It's going to be, oh, look at the black hothead he went after, the white guy. That's know? right. So they get into a little of that. I would have liked to have seen more of that. Yeah. All right. Well, I'm, I'm definitely going to check it out. I, I'm a, so we're seeing